My name is uh, Zach Center. Um, not the football player for the Detroit Lions, but uh, I'm the computer nerd that's below him. Um, it's my first cybersecurity talk, um, and I'm very excited to actually be at Circle CityCon and to give back to the uh, uh, cybersecurity community. Uh, like a lot of us, I'm a uh, uh, tinker at heart. I like to figure out how computers and code work. Uh, and I'm also a gamer, uh, but professionally I'm a security analyst and um, have four certifications. I actually just passed my fourth one last week. Uh, and in between exams, I like to do hobbyist research. And what we'll be seeing today is the results of uh, that research. So a quick overview of uh, what I'll be talking about uh, during this talk is uh, start with some history for some so social media command and control, um, and then kind of overview some of the proof of concept. And then I'll actually demo the proof of concept if the demo gods allow it today. Um, and then see how we can actually detect some of this in our environments. So the purpose of this kind of uh, started with, we focus a lot on the traditional command and control methods. So looking for Cobalt Strike or Empire or AFL uh, on our networks. Um, but what about the non-traditional methods like DNS Cat or P-Tunnel? We also look for those typically as well. But what about social media? Uh, you can see a bunch of um, connections to Twitter or Reddit or any other social media platforms out there. That could be some signs of command and control. Uh, so professionally, as I said, I'm a blue teamer. And what I like to do is take my research and apply that to my threat hunting. Uh, so during one of my exams where they talked about Twitter being used for command and control, I started thinking, why not Reddit or even your logs? And to really emphasize, even though I'm focusing on Reddit, this isn't really a vulnerability on their side. It's actually a feature. And I guess we can kind of say that about legit vulnerabilities as well. Um, but in this case, it truly is just a feature. So, so uh, starting with the history, uh, we have the iWorm, which was a piece of Mac OS malware. Um, I'm not exactly sure why they called it the iWorm, because it actually didn't exploit anything. Uh, as far as I can tell, it'd be packaged with a torrent uh, that the user would download themselves and end up running on their computer and compromise themselves. Uh, but what it is is a sophisticated method for re remote controlling a host and then exfilling the data that's on the host. Uh, so most users um, would have no idea that this would actually be happening. Um, on macOS, there's no egress firewall. There is an ingress, um, but no egress firewall. So if the application calls out to Reddit, the user won't actually notice that's happening. Egress firewalls do exist. Uh, so if you have a Mac, I highly recommend researching some of them. Um, like other Mac malware, it will persist using a plist. Um, current versions of Mac OS will actually notify the user when that happens. Um, but you can also use CronTap. That's actually still a part of Mac OS. That's not one of the many things that Apple's taken away from us. Um, and as far as I can tell, that doesn't actually notify the user when that happens. Uh, and then from there, once the application on the host starts to run, it'll start to gather what's actually on the host and then open up a port uh, to wait for external commands. And that's actually where Reddit comes in. So the uh, malware will do an MD5 of the dates and then take the first eight bytes of that MD5 and search Reddit to actually get a result. I don't know how it actually managed to get a result because of Reddit's indexing, but it does. And it actually returns uh, r slash Minecraft server lists, um, which would have all the IPs. And you can actually kind of see a screen cap of that. Um, the subreddit no longer exists. Uh, I'm not sure if Reddit took down the subreddit or if the user themselves actually took it down. Um, but I'll touch on that a little later. Um, but it would go ahead and grab those IPs and pull them locally, and it will do a check to see which ones are on a banned list and which ones are still good to go. I'm not exactly sure how it differentiated which ones are banned and which ones are good, but it'll start to listen or send uh, commands and all of its data to the good IPs. But since the subreddit no longer exists, that created a single point of failure. So the uh, analyst who actually tore apart this malware um, said that it only got so far before the application just kind of sat there uh, because it wasn't actually able to do anything else without having some sort of uh, IPs to talk to. Um, so it just kind of is dead in the water. Another uh, uh, social media one is uh, Microsoft TechNet. Um, APT17, and I'm not exactly sure what cool name we decided to give them, uh, would perform command and control using the uh, that blog. 
um, the APT would post its encoded uh, commands onto the, the site, and it would be used to actually direct the black coffee malware that's already sitting on various hosts. Um, and that would end up directing the malware to their command and control servers. Uh, this was later contained by both Microsoft and FireEye, uh, but this really emphasizes that APTs will actually conduct their business in uh, plain sight and to just kind of hide amongst all the users um, and not be noticed. Uh, the picture isn't actually an example of command and control, but it is my pet peeve on the site where someone says, hey, I have a problem, and everybody says, yeah, same here, and they don't offer anything to help. Um, so that comes on, or comes to my uh, proof of concept. The idea came from r slash security, where a user was talking about uh, Reddit bot hijacking and using command, and co command injection to actually control that bot. And I kind of sat there thinking, why would anybody code their bot to do that? Uh, that's really dumb. Then I started coding a script that would do exactly that, and here I am actually talking about that script. Um, the back end of the script will use JSON, and we'll search a JSON file to actually pull code. Um, so my thought is, post code on Reddit, Reddit places that code into the JSON file, and then the backend script will go ahead and pull that code to the host itself. I use two accounts. One account issues a pivot, and then that pivot account is what actually issues the command. And I'll touch on why I did that later on. Um, and another thing I really wanted to emphasize is uh, to not use the API. Uh, because this is definitely against Reddit's uh, terms of service for the API. Um, and it would also create another single point of failure. So you have to hard code that API key into the, the code itself, otherwise it's not going to be able to do anything. Um, so if that API key gets revoked, your script on the back end is not going to run. Uh, and then I added some checks to mitigate that whole hijacking concern that the user kind of brought up initially. Um, and why not use this to uh, remotely control your uh, your servers? Uh, please don't do that. <laughs> it's a really bad idea. Um, so going into JSON, uh, if you couldn't tell, I'm a really big fan of JSON. Uh, you can put so much data into one file, it's uh, it's pretty incredible. So for example, uh, NIST's in, uh, entire CVE library is actually in JSON files. Uh, each year has its own JSON file, and they just keep adding to that file. So uh, what you can do is you can download them, unzip them, uh, and then build an application to interpret it. And then at that point, you have your own vulnerability database that you just have to update with the new CVEs or the new JSON files for uh, uh, the current year when they add new CVEs to it. Um, I would go as far as to say that it's pretty essential to actually uh, learn JSON and how it works uh, in our current day and age. So this is uh, an example of JSON. Um, I think of... Uh, I might actually show this more in my VM because uh, it's kind of uh, tricky to wrap your head around it just kind of by looking at it. Uh, but an uh, overview of it is it's a bit like XML, but it's, uh, it's cleaner in my opinion. Uh, the structure is more um, consistent, I guess you can say. I, uh, XML is consistent as well. It's nicer. Um, both Python and C Sharp have fantastic Python or JSON parsers uh, that can actually iterate through the key value pairs. Um, and you'll typically see J JSON with um, websites that support it for their backend, uh, or even your logs. So AWS will output its logs into a JSON format. Um, so you can kind of consider this to be the backend of uh, the website and of certain applications. So this is what's on the backend, and this is actually what is seen uh, to the user. So this um, the Past slide and this slide are from the same post from r slash rear puppers. Um, and we can see the, the comments here, the usernames, upvotes, all that stuff is in the JSON file. This is just what's actually visually shown to the user themselves. So this is the slide that I think I'll actually do in my virtual machine. Pull it up. So... I kind of wish I didn't do it this way. So this is uh, what JSON actually is. And this is from an actual web page. The zero is, and can I, uh, everybody actually see this in the, the back? Or good? Cool. Um, so the zero is the actual post itself. And then the one stores all the comments. And you can actually go through and kind of grab them all. So data is just one holding for them all. And what actually matters is children. Um, this is where all the comments are stored. 
and you can kind of see it starts off at zero and then kind of increases as it goes down. Uh, and then you can actually dive into each one and uh, see what the comment is. You can see the author here, uh, where's something, the actual post that they did. So that's kind of what JSON is. Um, you can just kind of pull it apart. Uh, this is actually what it shows up as. It's kind of gross. Uh, but when you uh, structure it nicely, it shows up like this. And Firefox has a really nice uh, way of actually showing that. Bring this back up. So at that point, it's just a matter of iterating through all that data in order to get to the, the comment or whatever uh, key that you actually want. Uh, keys can have a value of other keys. So as we saw, we had um, uh, data and then another key of children and then another key of body, which had a value that you needed. Um, and it's just kind of using whatever parser to get through uh, the actual uh, data to get to what you want. This is a small snippet from my proof of concept uh, where you can see that um, I get the length. So as I said, you uh, see all the comments in children starting off at zero and going to whatever comments are posted in there. So you, that's uh, what you need to find for the length. Uh, and then from there, you iterate through that in a for loop. And then within that, you can place the comment length where com uh, POS is. Um, and then it'll search that specific comment for the uh, data and then the body, which is where the comment is. This would actually be used to pull out the command that's stored in the JSON file. So, as I said, the value can be interpreted, um, and uh, this serves a legitimate purpose. For Reddit bots, this is how they actually go through um, a post. So, like those really annoying grammar bots that say you missed the apostrophe in, uh, in it. Uh, this is one way that it can actually do it. It'll just kind of go through the entire subreddit until it finds someone's error and call them out on it. Um, but those use an API key. They're allowed to post. Um, Without using the API key, the most you can do is interpret what you see. You can actually, it's, um, you can't go back to it. So it's a one-way communication. Uh, with this proof of concept, I didn't really um, dive into the egress method for this. I kind of felt it was a little out of scope. Um, but it wouldn't be too difficult to actually uh, add that feature in. It would probably be as simple as the script on the back end waiting for someone to post domain colon, and then the domain you'd want to send your data out to. Uh, so that kind of comes to my proof of concept. So I named it Cracker.py. Uh, it's written in uh, Python 3. Uh, it's no particular reason why I chose that beyond it's my favorite language. Uh, it's modern. Um, and it's something that I know decently well. The name comes from the book Oryx and Crake, where there's a character uh, named Crake who created a bunch of, um, I guess you can call them other humans, called Crakers. And for some reason, I kind of felt that was fitting for the whole uh, bot herder zombie analogy, um, just kind of in my own way. Uh, it's a single file, um, and if it needs to create additional files, it'll create those in the slash temp directory, which is where a lot of uh, Linux and Mac malware will dump all of its garbage. Um, I tried to convert it to an uh, executable, but I, my code's not sloppy, but it's probably not very efficient, and I would just import full uh, modules, so like the, the uh, JSON uh, library is probably very big, and I just pulled that whole thing into my code, and it created a 300, meg 300 megabyte file that would just hang when you would run it. Um, so I'm sure if I actually pulled out the pieces that I needed um, and actually kind of cut it down a little bit, it might work. But when I tried to convert it, it, it didn't work, uh, which was a little bummer, but oh well. Um, so to really walk through the process of how my proof of concept works, a um, few things to keep in mind when I actually get to the demo. I don't have a destination server, but we will simulate that by writing to the host to kind of show that the actual script ran, performed the command, um, and was successful. Um, I'm going to do a mix of pre-recorded videos and a live demo. I'll start with the live demo. Um, I did perform uh, the correct uh, rituals of eating nothing but pizza and gummy bears for the past weekend. Um, but, uh, and that's kind of why, um, or the reason for that being is um, I didn't have time to age these accounts, and these are just throwaway accounts that I will never use again. Um, and Reddit uh, post limits uh, new accounts for one post per eight minutes. So you post, and then you have to wait eight minutes until you can post again. Um, but that's it, the way around that is you just age your accounts. Um, 
I guess I'm not good enough at uh, uh, getting karma points to actually get around that in 15 days. Um, but I start off with doing a base64 encoded command. So for instance, you take um, ping dash c4 and then 1.1.1.1 and then pipe that to base64. Of course, you have to like do printf before that to actually send that to base64. Uh, and then, and that's actually, I do that to just hide it from the normies on Reddit. Um, and then you post it onto a, a subreddit and it'll show up in the JSON. So we can actually see here, this is a base64 encoded command as a comment. Um, strangely enough, nobody actually downvotes these. I've had a couple just sitting out there and nobody seems to question it um, or downvote it or ban them, uh, which I find strange. Um, but one way or another, Reddit will place that in the correct uh, key for you. It'll be consistent and never changes. Uh, so it's just a matter of getting to that key and then pu pulling out the value into a variable and then sending that into a, uh, a system call. So this is the script running. It calls out every 5 to 15 seconds. Uh, once that timer ends up or ends, it'll go out to Reddit, pull whatever comment is the most recent, decode the base64, and then pipe or send that out to a system call to perform the action. And then it just goes and waits for another command. Uh, and then we're off to the proof of concept demo. Uh, so I'll run the following commands. Um, I've been playing around with uh, some of um, the previously mentioned command and control applications a bit more recently, and I noticed you can drop additional uh, files onto the host. So I started thinking, why not do that with this? Uh, so it's actually just a matter of coding out a shell script, and then basic support encoding that and posting that as a comment. So that one I'll do live, and I'll do the lowball low uh, uh, recon ones as videos. Um, those will be a ping command, a ls of of the system, and then an ID. All right, let's hope this goes well. All right, so we will start up the script. All right, cool. So now it's calling out to Reddit, waiting for a command to actually be posted. So we will go ahead and pull this out of the way quick so I can get the command. So what this command is, um, is a script. So I actually have it coded out here quick. So it's really simple. It's just a while loop that'll create uh, 14, yeah, 14 files. Uh, name them hello ccc, uh, and then the number of whichever iteration it's on. Uh, and then it'll create that in the temp directory. So really simple. Um, you have to write it out as one line and just kind of new line character, all these, um, which is kind of tedious, but meh, it does its deed. <laughs> uh, so we'll grab that. My so I felt that it was fitting to post these in uh, uh, r slash casual conversations for some reason. Um, a little ironic. So we'll go ahead and post that. Then reply. So now, after its next call, we'll see it uh, say command received. And what we should see is a bunch of uh, files created on the host locally. Um, and all of them within it should say ccc or hello cc. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what that actually does. Um, so we'll close out of that. And I will go to some of the videos here. And I kind of wish I, ah, yes, that's it. Okay, so um, we demoed a uh, script dropping onto the host and running. Uh, surprisingly, it's, Strange. Uh, I'm not sure why I think of or didn't think of it initially, but like you don't need sudo commands to do any of it. It's actually just you know write the script to the host, ch mod it, and then run it. Um, so it doesn't even need elevated creds to actually perform that. So you don't have to pop up any sort of dialog box um, unless you need to access something that uh, is permission restricted. Um, we will go ahead and see what happens when you run the id command. So same process. 
starting the script, and then replying the comment here. The new Reddit format made this kind of a pain. It's so resource intensive. It lagged my VM so much. Then we'll see that the command was received, and then the ID uh, was ID command was actually performed. Um, and then here's one for LSO. Let's skip to the part where post the command. So we have an LSO of the uh, system itself and a ping command. And I'd assume that you would use this to test, you know, what you can actually do. Um, like if they're blocking outbound ping requests, uh, see if you can maybe drop ptunnel onto the host and use that for your command and control as well. And so we have our outbound uh, ping communications allowed. So, uh, and that's just a small subset of what you can run. As long as you don't need uh, sudo to actually perform it, you can you know run this as well. Um, so pretty neat. Uh, so we'll pull the keynote back up. I'm glad the pizza and gummy bears worked right. Uh, so why do I call this resilient? Uh, it's in the title. I talked a lot about Reddit, so why is this process resilient? Well, that goes back to the whole two accounts thing. So if the pivot account gets removed or something along those lines, the script will actually back out to the main account and just wait for that main account to go ahead and post a new user. And then once a new user is posted, it'll go ahead and actually cache it and then use that for its further command and control. Um, but what about that main account? If that gets removed, it'll actually just back out to the whole subreddit and just wait for that main account to pop back up or a new main account to pop up. Um, there's a version out there that isn't done yet, um, but it'll actually back out to r slash all. So it, you know, as long as it's within the top 40 posts, it'll find it. Um, the reason why that one's not ready to show yet is it takes forever to actually iterate through all that, and I think it's because my code's not efficient. So at some point, I should fix that. Um, but you also have two channels you have to take down. So you have the Reddit channel for your ingress. So that's two accounts you'd have to get removed uh, to actually stop this. Uh, and arguably, will you be able to stop it if it keeps backing out to the subreddit itself? Um, but then you have the egress method. How detectable is that? Are you going to be able to see clear text? Is it encrypted? Um, and it's just a matter of these accounts posting domain colon and then whatever new domain they actually want to exfil their data to. So I would, you know, say that this is some difficult method to actually block both channels and stop the, the I guess you can call attack uh, efficiently. So I talked a lot about Red Team, uh, and as I said, I'm a Blue Teamer professionally. So let's talk a little bit about how we can actually protect ourselves from this. Uh, so probably the best method is statistical analysis, but because of the whole encryption thing on the web. That's going to be kind of difficult. Um, you're only going to see a domain in your proxy his or your proxy logs. Same with uh, if NetFlow or your um, your flow logs actually have domains in them. That'll be um, just a domain, nothing specific. Uh, for the most part, you'll just see a bunch of users not doing their work and showing up on Reddit, uh, doing whatever they do on Reddit. Probably your sysadmins. Um, so how do you actually get accurate statistical analysis, and what kind of IOCs can we get from this? Uh, the answer is you have to man the middle of your encryption. So I set up a lab to actually test uh, this theory out. Uh, so I have uh, Ubuntu 18 as the guest. Uh, I have Python 3 for the script. Um, I use Squid for the non-SSL proxy. Um, and you're probably wondering why did I use it just for uh, the non-decrypted traffic, or the non-decrypted traffic, yeah. Uh, well, I tried to do it um, by decrypting, uh, but for some reason it kept saying my SSL children were dying, and I couldn't figure out how to stop that from happening. <laughs> um, so I kind of gave up on them. 
and tried finding a different tool. And I came across a really uh, cool tool called uh, MITM Proxy. Uh, and it's actually just a pip install away, so if you need to, you know, quick and easy uh, see encrypted traffic, uh, you could do pip uh, 3 install MITM Proxy and you have it. Uh, really cool application. It actually took me 15 minutes to set up, and I wish I knew that initially because I spent two days trying to use Squid for this. Um, so here's an example of what you'll see at a non-decrypted uh, proxy. Not much to see. You have a bunch of Reddit domains, and that's about it. Um, and that's where it starts to kind of sway your statistical analysis. Um, because it's not very specific, you'll end up seeing, uh, as I said, your sysadmins trying to figure out some sort of problem they have, or some worker who doesn't want to do work and is just on Twitter all day. Um, so what can we actually do with this? Uh, you can't really grab a packet capture. Well, I mean, you can. You're just going to see encrypted traffic, so nothing useful there. Um, you might be able to get a top talker, but even at that, the whole just the domain part is going to sway the results of that. Uh, so probably the best bet would be to decrypt your traffic, which in itself has some uh, connotations that could be concerning. Uh, that makes your security controls an attack vector as well because they have all this valuable information in it. But this is a lot more telling. So we have a user who is constantly calling out to a Reddit user's account. That's a little strange. Uh, maybe a subreddit you would see frequently, but not so much a user account. Uh, I never really go to other users' accounts uh, unless I want to snoop on what they have for a small period of time. Um, so that stands out quite a bit. Um, the username itself, I mean, that could be anything. Uh, strangely enough, that's just a hex, I believe, for bits, and I'm surprised it wasn't taken. Um, but the ending to it is um, surprising. Uh, .json uh, URL. Uh, that's not uh, common for Reddit. A lot of, um, you'll see .json in your logs pretty frequently. Um, sites use it for their um, apps, for instance, if they have to pull down a JSON file to actually do something with it. Uh, you'll see that loading. But Reddit doesn't actually do that for just loading a normal web page. Um, you'll see the typical just HTML page loading. So that's another ion. Uh, but this, all in all, leads to more accurate statistical analysis. At that point, you'll be able to find out that this one system is calling out to this one user account every 5 to 15 seconds, and then be able to hop on that host and see that there's a Python script calling home uh, to Reddit. Um, so. Another thing that I'm kind of curious about is um, hunting for this type of activity on Reddit. Are there other command and control currently happening on Reddit? Um, I haven't had much time to explore this too much, but it is something I kind of want to explore a bit more. Um, in the past week or two, I tried doing manual hunting, which was painful. Uh, again, Reddit, fix your search engine, please. Um, it didn't really return any results that were helpful to me. Um, so I started thinking, what could we actually do to see if there's other uh, threat actors on Reddit that are performing command and control? And the solu solution I kind of came up with is um, probably to just passively crawl Reddit, all of Reddit, which sounds like a lot, and it's because it is. There's, I don't have actual numbers, but I would assume that Reddit generates huge amounts of new content every couple seconds. Uh, I mean, you have users posting new things, commenting on new things. Um, thousands, if not, you know, getting up to the million of subreddits that are out there. Um, so it would be a huge task. It would take a lot of computing resources to actually do this, but maybe it's worthwhile to possibly find some sort of attack groups out there using Reddit for its command and control. Um, my thought is you could probably use the API key for this. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the API offers beyond, like, more uh, interaction with Reddit. Um, but it'd kind of be better than just using uh, the .json files. Maybe it can offer some more advantages. Um, but the other issue is you would have to teach this bot to go ahead and look for what I think is command and control. And I think that defeats the purpose a little bit. The whole point to these attackers is they don't want to be noticed. They don't want to be predictable. So if I'm telling them this is what command and control looks like and the bot starts looking just for that, you're going to miss what actual legit attackers are out there. Um, so I don't really think that's the best way to do it. So I'm still trying to figure out what um, way to actually hunt for this type of stuff would be um, the best. But so far, I haven't had much time to actually code that out. Um, but nonetheless, it's a project that I would like to kind of undertake. 
So how do we mitigate this? Um, your best bet, uh, as always, is application whitelisting. Um, if you can actually handle that in your environment, someone downloads a malicious application, it's automatically going to pop up. Um, and you'll be able to have your SOC hunt that down and start your, your whole remediation process. Um, but I kind of also believe that developers are an increasing target currently. Um, they have all the tools you need. I mean, they have Python, they have um, whatever application that you need to perform your malicious deeds um, under the radar already on their hosts. Uh, we saw that actually with the whole NPM repo um, where they had a Bitcoin wallet jacker within the code. And it, wasn't, it wasn't noticed until one developer uh, decided to actually look at the code and realize that uh, there is some sort of issue with the code that should be investigated. Um, and it kind of defeats the purpose of open source. I mean, if you're not vetting the code you're downloading before you download it, what's the point? You're just pulling down random code. Um, so it's developers, I assure you, are not looking at whatever code they're pulling down. And you should really watch out for that. Uh, it's almost as if you have to have something, something in between the developers and the internet um, to do the work for them uh, because they're definitely not doing that. They're just pulling down whatever they want left and right. Um, the other thing is harden your systems. So a lot of creatives have Macs, um, but Mac OS also comes with Python already installed on the host. Um, does your person who just does Photoshop actually need Python? Uh, the answer is no. Um, some applications actually kind of do weird things with uh, scripting languages on Mac OS. So for instance, um, Microsoft products, uh, do they will spawn a shell script to actually do what they need to do instead of actually coding it themselves. Uh, they'll just have the system do it on their behalf. So I'm not exactly sure if um, certain applications need Python 2.7 to actually do what uh, some of their functions are. But nonetheless, your Photoshopper doesn't need Python. That should be removed. The other thing is Mac OS comes with Netcat, which is a good tool to pivot and to do lateral movement. Um, it doesn't come with execution built in, but that's trivi trivial. You just pipe it out to a, you know, a bash or something along those lines. Uh, and again, creatives don't need that type of tool. Your developers might to test, I guess, if a port is open. Um, but then again, you should probably be watching what your developers are doing. So um, that leaves us with uh, some time for questions. Uh, so you guys can have at it if you haven't. Yeah. Um, so I haven't approached any of them, mostly because this isn't a vulnerability. Um, so, I mean, if I did approach them, they're going to be like, yeah, no, we know. Uh, you can access JSON files. Um, the most I would think Reddit, for instance, would be able to do is perform some sort of, um, like, if they notice that there's one application that's making a lot of calls to one page, maybe throttle that. And the reason why I say throttle versus just outright block it is maybe it is a legit user. You don't actually harm um, the, the user um, interaction with the site until you can do a full investigation to make sure that you're blocking something that needs to be blocked. Um, so I, I haven't approached any of them, um, but uh, maybe maybe this will be seen by one of them and something will come of it. I don't know. Um, yeah. So to answer your question, no, I haven't. Yep, so uh, I have it set to 5 to 15 seconds, so it'll just pick some random number within that range. Um, you can set those values to anything you want. So if you want to go low and slow, set it out to like maybe once every two hours. Um, or you can make it as fast as one second. Every second, hammer read it and pull down your code. Um, but again, that's going to cause a lot of noise. I'm sure some sort of SOC analyst will notice that and be like, oh, that's cool, pass. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so... 5 to 15 seconds, change it to whatever you want. Any others? Yeah. Um, so I've, I've actually put a lot of thought into that. Um, currently, no. Um, it's kind of, I guess, uh, an ethical standpoint. Um, so again, I'm a blue teamer. I don't want to actually cause issues, I guess. 
Um, but I have thought about it, but ethically, I guess right now I haven't, but um, I might at some point, but I'm still kind of just sitting on it. Um, if I were to do it, I would have to clean up some of the code. <laughs> uh, again, I'm not terrible at the whole hygiene in code, but like it could have more efficiency <laughs> built into it. Um, but maybe at some point. Um, if, uh, if I do, I'd probably announce it on my Twitter. So if you want to follow it to see if I do, um, then yeah, by all means. Uh, any others? <laughs> mm. So I have actually. Um, oh, totally. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I was actually um, uh, last. A uh, week I was at a graduation party for a friend and uh, I was talking to him about it and they pointed that out actually, you know, a big block of text looks really weird on Reddit. Um, so uh, steganography is one potential for this. Um, Python actually has a library for doing stego. Um, it would just be a bit, you'd have to rework some of the code a little bit because as a comment you can't post a picture in a way that it can pull it uh, from Reddit. Um, but if you post or do a post on Reddit, you'll be able to do it that way. Um, so it would just be a matter of reworking the code. Uh, another thought I had is, um, and this might actually make it more suspicious, is uh, add random spaces in your base64 uh, code. And then when you pull it down to the host, just remove it all and you have your whole base64 encoded uh, command. But then again, you have uh, spaces and where those space, you know, in between those spaces is just jumbled characters. Uh, that's going to look weird, if not even more weird, because at that point your mind's trying to interpret um, a sentence that's not a sentence. Um, but it, nonetheless, it's a thought. So I think Stego would actually be the better option uh, now that I just kind of talk it out a little bit. You'd be able to have a bunch of codes and doc pictures. <laughs> All right. Uh, any others? All right, cool. Well, thanks for uh, showing up, everyone. Uh, hope you had a good con and uh, enjoy the, the rest of it.